uh, Director Lee Simons, is Lee here? Or is he yeah, he had a runoff. Okay. Yeah, he had to make a little trip. Well, okay, so Lee, Lee will join us here in a second. Yeah. So he'll be a part of this Q&A. But uh, the good thing is, uh, the first couple of questions are really for John right at the top. I think the first question that everybody wants to know the answer to is, where do we get some of that Indian hemp? <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, uh, it's, it's, it's actually been saving me, so I, I still have, have some left up there. <laughs> Uh, no, it, it actually was, uh, somebody gave it to me, I, I forgot who it was, and it was that barber actually, the barber up there, he said, try this on your hair, and I, I liked it, and I've just been using it Other ever since. Other well, I'm sure. Um, okay, well, before we dive into talking about the film, uh, John, it's not, um, obviously it's not every day that somebody has, is able to sit down and watch a documentary about their life, let alone partake in the making of a documentary. So if you could just share with us, what's it like to watch something like this? Uh, when you sit here, you watch what's going through your heart, through your mind, through your head, to, to watch that story unfold in front of you that you lived, to have taken part of the journey of telling that story. Just yeah. share about what goes on in your heart when that happens. Yeah, you know, those emotions, you know, comes up inside of you. And, um, you know, it, you, you want to try to put them away. And, and try to like keep them in that box. But when I watch it, I, I was even debating about coming out here and watching it again uh, because, you know, just the pain, you know, and, the, and those struggles that uh, me and my family went through, uh, you, you just want to like block it out, you know what I mean? But I, I know every time I watch it, it gets a little easier and easier, um, you know, to, uh, you know, think about what, what those was like, those struggles and those pains that I was going through. Um, but it was, it was interesting just to like, you know, think about those times and, and try to, you know, Lee try to capture that as best as he could and uh, trying to convey it to the audience. And uh, I thought he did a good job of doing that. Definitely did, definitely did. Thank you. Um, well, to start talking about this documentary, let's just, I guess, start at the beginning. Lee, uh, how did this project come about? Where did the, where was the idea first spark? How did you and John meet and connect and decide, hey, we could actually collaborate on telling your story? Just talk about how that happened. Sure, well, um, I was a fan. I grew up in New York and watched all of John's games and my closest friends and I always watch the battles and John was always our favorite player and when a really dear friend of mine who I uh, named Jim Rothschild he was running the sponsorship division at uh, WWE came down with brain cancer and uh, it wasn't going well and we thought what can we do and because John has a foundation I had no relationship with John other than being a fan I found out he had a foundation I called up and I said um, whoops there goes the mic. Um, I said, uh, can John come to lunch? Can, you know, my friend's not doing well, it's cancer. And I spoke to Jennifer Albert, who's the head of the foundation. And she asked John, he said, yes. He said he would come. So we met because of the John Starks Foundation and because of John's just passion for philanthropy. And we blew my friend's mind. He thought he was just coming to a lunch and John showed up. John Starks walked in, his favorite player, my favorite player. And John brought his book, the book on his life. And he signed it for everybody, and we all read it. I read it that night. And uh, I called, called him up the next day and said, can we have lunch? Because I think your book and your life is a movie. Now, I'm a filmmaker, and I had no plan whatsoever of doing a documentary on John Starks. I was just thrilled to have lunch with him. And I was just hoping there wouldn't be any broken dishes or no, no kicks or anybody getting it, you know. But, uh, you know, I was assured that he's a different man off the court, and he is. And so this is typical John. So we went to lunch, and for every young filmmaker out there, I had a vision, I had an idea, and I had an advantage because I had lived watching every game he ever played. So I pitched him my vision for the movie, and he said yes at lunch. And the next day, we were at the garden shooting. We didn't even have a contract yet. He, I said, let's shoot. He said, okay. 
and we went and with a lot of that first interview that you guys see where he's talking about his family and his life was the day after he said yes to the documentary. So, uh, well, and John, just, uh, what was your response when the idea was proposed, and did you think, I don't know, or was it like, did, did something register inside to say, yeah, I can see value of this, and I want to pursue this? Well, Lee, to be honest with you, uh, just his passion and uh, what he thought about, you know, the book itself and about my journey and my life. Uh, he said, this is like perfect. This is like a very inspirational uh, story. Uh, it's still not complete. Uh, we left a lot of things out. Uh, but, you know, I just felt good about it, you know, going into it. And, and I thought that, okay, because I didn't heard it before people talked about it. I, I had so many incredible people come up to me and say, you inspire me. Kids come up to me. Adults come up to me. Said, say you inspire me, and then when Lee said that, it just kind of clicked, and I was like, okay, let's do it. And what was the title of the book? John Stark's My Life. John Stark, okay. So, because that leads me to, this, to my next question. The title of this film, Keep Shooting, I think is very appropriately titled, um, especially how... Uh, Lee, the way he tells your story, it builds towards making that point, sending that message. And so my question is, when, when did that idea, that theme of keep shooting, come into play in terms of saying, this is, what, this, is, this is how the filter through which we need to tell John's story, was it right from the beginning, or was it along the way, and it sort of evolved, and you began to realize, yeah, this is, this is the theme of what we want to talk about. Well, as I recall it, it was the very beginning. It was right there in the pitch at that lunch. Because here's the thing, why I was able to be inspired with this vision. Like Pat Riley, every single New York Knicks fan always wanted John to keep shooting. Always. We never wanted the ball out of his hand, and we never cared what he missed. So that was not just his teammate's journey and his passion, but that's how we experienced him. So. To me, you know, game seven was a giant disappointment, but the way John came back was the inspiration. So I think it was there from the beginning, wasn't it? Yeah, it, was it definitely hard. was, yeah. And the thing I want to say about John is that it wasn't easy to get him to say yes, but when I told him that I thought that this movie was not about him, but it was about what it would do for others, I think that's what he turned. Mm -hmm. I think that's where he said yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah uh, no question. Uh, as you can see in that movie, I also had a hip issue, so I was try, trying my best to walk straight for the most part of that, that movie. Uh, but yeah, it, w once he told me that, that he felt like this is, could be an inspiration to a lot of people. And I just, you know, sometimes you just have to get outside of yourself and look to help others. And, and my mother, my grandmother, my uncle, you know, my whole family, that's what we're all about, we're about helping each other. And, and so it was just a natural for me to uh, just say yes, yes to the movie. Um, and, and what I particularly like about that title and really having that be the theme is it takes that low point of game seven and reclaims it, reclaims it from the cynics, reclaims it from the critics. You know, who said, why, why, did you, why did you keep shooting, Pat? Why did you let him keep shooting? And the way you really sum it up at the end of the film, John, about just saying, you know, when you stop shooting, that's when you lose. That's yeah. when you quit. That's when you choke. Yeah. Um, so uh, just to reclaim that thing that people would look at as a low point and to say, no, that's the whole point, yeah. I just thought was really powerful. Um, uh, John, you know, obviously a lot of the story is reflecting on the pains, the hardships, even the tragedies uh, that you experienced growing up here in Tulsa, but maybe just take a moment and share some of the fond memories of Tulsa mm -hmm. and why you're grateful to be a Tulsa. Uh, Tulsa is a great city. Obviously, you know, like any other great city, it had its ups and downs, and, and we know what that's, that's all about. Uh, but this city has always seemed to rise up 
the people always seem to rise up. Communities always seem to rise up, no matter what. And you know, this is where I got my my lessons. This is where I got uh, taught a lot of things about life. And, and so I always appreciate Tulsa and the people in it. Growing up on the north side, obviously, you know that's where I got most of my teaching, and 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 it felt good uh, to see so many of individuals such as myself, you know, uh, Wayman Tisdale, God rest his soul. Uh, he was just a beautiful individual. Anthony Bowie, Lee Mayberry, I can go on and on. Eton Thomas, Richard Dumas, I, I can go on and on how many great athletes uh, have came off the north side of Tulsa, Oklahoma, as well as the south side of Tulsa, Oklahoma. But this is where I got my teaching and, and my upbringing and, and and learned about the game of life and, and learned about people in general. Um, you, one, of the, one of the very interesting things about the film, about your story, um, it, it made me think of the saying of how a person's greatest strength is also quite often can be their greatest weakness. Um, John, there's no doubt that if you didn't play with a chip on your shoulder and without aggressiveness, you never would have achieved all that you achieved. But it also led to moments of button rushing over the head and kicking up the ball and kicking out of games and yeah. you know, Patrick Ewing getting mad at you like, why are you doing this right now, right? Yeah. So a question first to you, John, and then we'll leave for you to follow. John, just how do you I guess wrestle and grapple with that. Yeah. And Lee, why, you know, it was very intentional, it seemed to me, that you were wanting to examine that dichotomy. Uh, so, John, talk about it, and then Lee, why did you want to examine? <laughs> That's the way I played basketball growing up, you know, playing against my older brothers, Tony, Monty, and playing against uh, guys that were a lot older than me uh, on, our, on our block. Uh, I had to be that way uh, because they said if you cried, you couldn't play. And so I had to be, I had to have that attitude, you know, when I stepped out there on the court or whatever we was doing. And, and so uh, my mentality was to like be chippy because I was normally the, the littlest guy out there that I was competing against. You're talking about when I was playing in the league, I was 6'2". They list me as 6'5", I was actually 6'2". Uh, 185 pounds, where they list me at 195 pounds. So then the most, the, the average height of guys back then was like 6'4", 6'5", weighed about 210, 215. So I had to go against these guys every single night. So yeah, I had an attitude. And I'm, <laughs> I'm glad I did have that attitude that, because that's what made me the player I was uh, back then. But Coach Riley used to, sit me down all the time and tell me, you know, John, I love the way you play. I love that intensity, but you have to be able to control it. And so I used to kind of work on it as much as I could. But when that fire comes up inside of me, sometimes it's spilled over just like, well, Reggie Miller situation needed to happen, though. That, that, <laughs> <laughs> that, that was a good thing because <laughs> Reggie was one of those guys, one of those players that he kind of agitated you all the time. And, and back then, you had to like fight your way and just kind of like how we grew up in the parks. You go into a new neighborhood, you know, you have to earn your respect. Or they wasn't giving it to you. That's the way it was back then. A little different now because the league is younger. But you talking about oh, those was older guys that had, you know, mortgages and families and, and the whole nine yards. And, and so they wasn't, Reggie was one of those guys that didn't give, give me my respect. So I had, to, I had to get it, and I got it. I never had a problem out of Reggie Miller for the rest of my career after that. Yeah. I guess even part of that too is rooted in, you weren't drafted. Yeah. You got cut right yeah. from the first team that signed you. Um, so it's just, I'm sure it's all just wrapped up in that. And this will be, again, uh, what, what compelled you to say, I really want to explore this dichotomy that you know, in the end. Well, first you have to understand, I'm a New York fan first. And it was never John's fault when he got thrown out of the game. It was always everybody else's fault. It was never John's fault. So that's just the way that was. But the truth is a great question. And when you make a film like this, and it's about someone's life, as a filmmaker, you always have 
a, a message and something you want to deliver in your story. You're always thinking about your audience. You know, it's not about you, it's about you. And so it's, it's a couple of things. First of all, it's being really authentic and true to the story. That's who he was. That's who he played. But that's how he played, and that worked for him. But the underlying message for me, which is why I made it such a big part of the film, which is what, you know, the heart and soul of the whole film was, be yourself. Be the best version of yourself and do what it takes to succeed. And that's what's exciting for me about this film. I like to say, anyone who interviewed me, all the media interviewed me, this is not a basketball movie. And as I got deeper and deeper into this film, what excited me about it was I believed, unlike some of the mega star movies and some of the movies about the most elite athletes in the world, I believe that this was a story that everyone could relate to. They could see their own struggles in, their own challenges, and that's what I wanted to exploit. And I thought it was really important to show John's true nature and character, good and bad, because I felt that it would deliver the message to the audience, just be the best version of yourself, whatever that is. Yeah, and then, you know, and when you do that, um, what it leads to is, you know, in your case, I mean, th this guy right here, the first guy in the history of the NBA to make over 200 three-pointers in one season. In the history of the league, and we all know the legends that came before him, nobody did it until he did it. Right? And that's what happens yeah. when you live, I mean, because when you live your full self, haters going to hate, right? At some point you're going to do something that they're not but you're also going to do something that, something that nobody else ever did. So, anyway, it's, it's Well, they, they, they breaking that record in about 40 games now. <laughs> well, yeah, it took me well, 82. Two people have crossed that barrier. Yeah, that's true, too. Yeah, Steph, like Steph and Clay. Yeah. Three I mean, yeah. it's only happened twice since then. Yeah. So, and even regardless of how much has happened since then, you were the first. Yeah. In, oh, it wasn't, you didn't do it in year five in the NBA, right? Yeah. I mean, this is after decades and decades and legends after legends. So, anyway. Thank you. Uh, I think it embodies what this film is all about. Um, uh, in this idea of keep shooting, it is, it, it is about grit and determination, never giving up, and, and sort of being a self-made person and not letting anything get in your way. But also the way life runs, there are things that are out of your control. And life can easily have zagged another way rather than how it zigged, right? And, um, and obviously a, a key moment of that was the injury with Patrick Ewing, you were you yeah. know, trying to dunk on him early on, the beginning of your career with the Knicks. Yeah. Right? I mean, if you hadn't been injured, maybe you would have been cut, and who knows what would have happened. I was just curious, was there anything else in your life, John, whether it be in your career or your life, that you can think back, oh man, I dodged a bullet there, <laughs> or, or if, man, I hadn't made that choice, or thank God I didn't make this choice. Is there something that jumps to mind that makes you think, or fate just blessed me. Anything that comes to mind? Yeah. <laughs> well, a lot of things came <laughs> came to mind back. Uh, you know, when I was growing up. Um, you know, Monty. Where Monty at? He out. Oh, he stepped out. Okay. But you know, when he was you know doing his thing on the streets and and selling and what have you, and and I was at that point. If do I want to do that? You know what I mean? Do I want to commit myself? Because that's a commitment. And do I want to go out there and chase that easy money? And I call it easy money, uh, but it was dangerous money. And so I literally got down on my knees and prayed and asked God to give me some direction. You know what I mean? Because I was at, like I said, at a crossroads in my life uh, that do I want to go to school or do I want to you know, do what he's doing? You know, he's making money. <laughs> and God said, no, hang it up. <laughs> that go money right there. <laughs> hey, when I wear my glasses, I'm going to change my name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But he, he remembered that, right, Lou? When I was in there in the, in the house, we was in the, in the front room. I remember that. And I said, I ain't had enough. 
And he like, I understand, this ain't for you. And that's when I got back in school, yeah. As, you know, powerful things like that, or even just, in a sense, the chance things, things you can't control, like, I think about, like, what would your career have been like if, if Pat Riley had never been the coach of the Nets? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you just think about that, but what, what do you think your career might have been? Yeah. Like, who was the coach before Riley? And, yeah. and if, if Riley yeah. hadn't come on board, how do you yeah. think things might have, could have played out? It, it would have been kind of ugly. <laughs> you know, we, we had Coach John McLeod, which was, you know, Coach McLeod was a great individual, great coach uh, during his time, but the game kind of, you know, kind of passed him by a little bit. Uh, but Coach Riley, knowing what he meant, uh, to this organization. He brought everything first class. When he came to us, we didn't know what first class was like. It was like we sleeping in Holiday Inns. When he come, we sleeping in Ritz Carlton. So <laughs> everything had to be top notch. And, and so, but you, as a player, you respect other players that's been through it. And we knew that Coach Riley been through it as a player. And obviously as a coach, winning championships when he was with the Lakers. So immediately, it, Immediately, he gets that cachet, you know, from the players, and you pay attention to everything he say, not sometime, but all the time. And uh, he really helped me grow my game as a player, as well as off the court, you know, because he was about family and making sure that, you know, our lives was taken care of off the court. So he helped us grow as, as people and, and as individuals, um, you know, from a coaching standpoint. Lee, about uh, just give us a sense of what it takes to make something like this. Obviously, people aren't just lining up and just saying, "Oh, you need something? We'll give it to you." Right? Um, so, from just you know the things you have to do to to get d digging into archives, setting up interviews, uh, arranging shoes. I mean, there's it can be so complicated, and it's and. I mean, it's got to be just one hustle after another. Give us an idea of what it takes to put something like this together. Well, it helps when you have John Starks. It helps when you have an executive director like Jennifer Alpert of, of his foundation and their willingness to work with me and, and break down boundaries. But it takes passion. Um, you have to really want it because it's, it's, it's a lot of... Um, phone calls, it's a lot of late nights, it's, uh, you know, for me it's been a personal investment, you know, to do this, you know, we, we're doing the film festival thing now because we're getting ready to sell the film. And all those things come together, you have to love what you're doing. And I would say for any filmmakers in, in the audience, you just have to be persistent, you're not always going to get a yes, but you just keep trying and you keep pushing and and uh, it's a labor of love, but it takes what it takes, and it takes all the skills of filmmaking, the right team, the right, you know, cinematographers, the right editors, the right, you know, uh, production coordinators, you know, all of that comes together. But I think underlying it, it just, it, it's really just, you have to want it, and you have to keep believing in it. And this is an interesting statistic, but we've been making the film for a decade. We started about 10 years ago, and we've just consistently, you know, shot and edited and recruited different people to be in the film, and we're, as John said, we're not quite done. We still need to get Michael, and we got Michael's number, <laughs> and uh, we still need to get Michael, and we still need to get Reggie. We had Reggie, and then something came up, and we've got to get Spike. we got a few more people to get, but um, all in all, it's going very well. Very well. well, I mean, in the filmmaking parlance, you still kept shooting, so. <laughs> wow, that's cool. That's cool. <laughs> I like that. Um, John, uh, talk about the John Starks Foundation. Uh, it's it was founded in 1994, and so it's nearly almost nearly 30 years now. Yeah. Which is impressive. That some that has endured this long, it's still going strong. But for those of out there who aren't familiar with the John Starks Foundation, just share what it's about, what you do, yeah. who benefits, and, and uh, what's going on. Yeah, so we give out scholarships, uh, you know, every year to uh, graduating seniors, and uh, two in Tulsa, then we give out, I don't know how many in the tri-state area, uh, 
but we've been doing it since 19... Tri-state area, meaning New York. New York, and New Jersey, and Connecticut. Um, we've just been very uh, fortunate and very blessed to have like good people uh, who truly support uh, our goals, what we want to get accomplished year after year, uh, to have the same sponsors uh, you know, come back every single year and, and just truly bless us with the funds to be able to give uh, these incredible students a, a chance at their opportunity in life. Uh, so we've been very fortunate. We do a uh, casino uh, cigar night uh, every June and we do a, a bowling event every February up in New York and we do a big blowout golf tournament at the end of September. Uh, for the foundation, and which is attended by incredible, incredible uh, friends of mine and uh, entertainers and, and what have you. So, but the foundation is, is, you know, we've been fortunate because you didn't hear about so many athletes' foundations come and go, but this one seems to, you know, maintain uh, since 1994, and and that's a blessing because we got good people working uh, uh, for me, uh, Jennifer Alpert, who's leading the charge. As the director of my foundation, uh, has been a, a, a rock, you know. And she, anybody know Jennifer? Know she, <laughs> she don't take no mess first and foremost, and she takes no for she won't take no. You can't ask her and like say uh, no, I can't do that. Okay, she'll come back around the corner and like okay, <laughs> wasn't you just saying something right here a second ago? Yeah, she she just a bulldog. Uh, but we, we've been fortunate enough, like I say, just continue to grow this foundation. We want to just get as many students off to college because we all been there and we all need a little help. And so we just want to give these kids the opportunity to, you know, truly uh, realize their dreams. And, and out of all the things that you could have made a foundation for, because there's obviously a lot of need causes, why was it on that uh, helping students get to that next level of education? Why did you choose that? Uh, my agent came to me and he asked me, he said, John, what you want to do in order to give back? And, and I thought about my life and I thought about my journey and, and what it took for me to get to college. And I wasn't recruited, obviously, because I only played one year of high school basketball. So I had to go the typical route that most of us have to go in order to get, you know, an education at the next level. Had to fill out Pell Grants and, and what have you. And I knew how tough that was, you know, trying to look and find scholarship money. And so I said, you know what, if I can get a, a foundation where I can, you know, raise money and, and give students the opportunity uh, to go to school, that's what I want to do. And he was all in. Lee Steinberg, who's my agent, agent uh, at the time, you know, he was big on giving back and making sure that his, his athletes give back. And so, but that was just inside of me to do that. Uh, I've got a couple more questions for these guys, but before I uh, ask those final questions, was there any other, anybody in the audience that had a question that come to mind that you're uh, back there? Um, how would you compare the NBA from today to back in the day? <laughs> and if you didn't hear that, his question was, how do you compare the NBA today, today to back then? Uh, what? Oh, I ain't gonna, <laughs> this is not soft. Uh, Be yeah, I am being honest. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's soft in that instance because the way we, we played back then, uh, it was more of a physical style of basketball. Uh, it was more of a big man's game back then. It was guys like Kim Olajuwon, Patrick Ewan, uh, Brad Daugherty. Uh, you know, we had so many incredible uh, big guys who played down low, uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. I, I can go on and on, all the Hall of Famers that, that I played during my era. Uh, but the game was more of inside, outside. It, now, it's just a guard, guard, small forward oriented league. And so you have to have those skills in order to play uh, in this game. But if you're watching the playoffs now, what's winning out, and they finally figured out maybe, is Milwaukee Bucks, they starting to get physical and go down low. You know what I mean? Because guys don't want to play that type of brand of basketball, that physical style of basketball anymore. And it uh, seems like Phoenix Suns are a little shocked by it, but yeah, that was just the way we played back then. You know, I'm not sure how, how you guys are playing it in the parks, 
<laughs> but that's the way we played it in the parks. Yeah, a physical game of basketball. Play some defense. Would your game be different, or how would it be different? No, I love to play this game. <laughs> it's easy to score. <laughs> I like literally it's easy to score. I, I was just telling guys they, you know, I belong to a cigar lounge up in, uh, up in Stanford, and I'm sitting there, and they be listening to me talk about how easy it is to come off picks. Normally, that big man is up on that pick and roll, so I couldn't get a, sh a shot off. Just come, those are the practice shots for me. I average every bit of about 30 points, easy, if I played in today's game. Cause coaches wouldn't get mad at me jacking all those threes up. <laughs> Anybody else with a question right there in the picture there? Um, before I ask my question, I just want to say uh, some of the best memories from my childhood in upstate New York were staying up late, watching yeah. you and the Knicks in my parents' bedroom, sitting on the floor, just talking about everything about life with my dad, so thank you for that. You're welcome. Love watching you live and die by the Knicks. Um, my question is, what's the best trash talk you had with Mike? <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Mike never talked trash. No, unless you talk trash to him and you didn't want to do that. <laughs> no, you want Michael to come in there. And I, I used to like kind of feel him out when I first get out there on the court. I was like, okay, he's, he's probably about 30 tonight. But then when he gonna come in there and, and I could see the intensity in his eyes, I say, okay, he's trying to put on a performance tonight, which he didn't bang me up for 55 a couple of times in the garden. <laughs> Uh, no, he, you, you don't want to talk noise to him. He, he's one guy that you don't want to get going because it's a difference when you're talking noise to a Vernon Maxwell. He don't have the green, green light. Mike got a green light that just stays on all night. You know what I mean? Those guys right there, you don't want to talk noise to them because he, he can shoot the ball anytime he wants to. Mine was always flashing, <laughs> always flashing with Patrick. <laughs> Yeah, another question right there. Yeah, hi. Hey, congratulations on the film. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much for what you did for Tulsa and everything that you give back. And I brought, I'm here with some guys, and we also are a big fan of the work from here. Uh, we used to bring the sports page to. You know, our first period and talk about the box score. And yeah. He was Jason. I was Jason Kidd, and he was Owen Starks, and, you know, and all those guys. But uh, is there a game that sticks out other than the ones mentioned here that you that stick out in your mind at any level that you can tell us about? Who's your favorite? And the question, if you didn't hear it, he's just asking: Is there any game that wasn't highlighted in the film that really sticks out in his mind? Oh man. Uh, it probably was a game against Chicago uh, at the Garden where they thought they had the game won. This was a regular season game, and they, they was up by like 15 points with about three minutes to go on the clock. And typical me, I get hot from the three and ran off like six or seven straight threes, and we end up winning the game. And you, Phil Jackson over there pulling his hair out, and Michael Jordan over there talking crazy. And they thought the game was over with, and we just kind of like reached down and just pulled it, pulled it out of the depths of them. And so that probably that game right there. But they also the shot that I hit to win the game against Phoenix, that last second shot, probably was one of the best feeling games I ever had is because when if you watch that play as the ball it was like 2.6 seconds on the clock the ball bounced out and literally I looked down at the other end of the shot clock and it said 2.6 then I had it in my mind and I started counting down in my mind how many seconds was on and you, I turned pump fake in 2.6 seconds most guys would rush that shot and literally Everything just slowed down. I mean, literally, I was like, <laughs> it just slowed down, and I just lined myself up, and bam, it hit the game winner, and my teammates come congratulate me, but they was like, I can't believe you just done that because you looked down at the other end, turned around, pump fake in 2.6 seconds, lined your feet up, and shot the ball. But it was just, everything was just slow at that time. But that was one of my best feeling, feeling shots ever. A um, couple more questions. Uh, Lee, um, you mentioned obviously you've been working on this and been really dedicated to the film, but you mentioned that this, this is starting to go into the next phase now. 
Uh, talk to us about uh, what you're looking to uh, really grab next. You mentioned a couple of interviews, and then where you're hoping to really bring this to. Yeah, so what's happened, uh, this is our second film festival. And first of all, before I forget, um, I want to thank uh, co-founder um, Clark Weens for inviting us and the programming director, Charles Foxen, better known as Chuck. Um, these guys reached out to us at our first film festival. They called me, they invited us here, and they made it a first-class experience, including a donation to the John Stars Foundation. Everything we asked for is yes, and you guys deserve to be celebrated for bringing this film. And uh, I also don't mean to embarrass you, but if everyone in John's family can stand up, this film would not be a great film without all your participation. So if you guys are here, let's give John's family a, a serious round of applause. Matthew's in the bathroom with him, is that it? But uh, thank you guys for everything you've done. So where we're headed with the film now is just great things are happening. We're being reached out, you know, from major networks, people that are interested, Madison Square Garden, ESPN. Um, and we're just in the beginning phases of this film finding a home. And because of film festivals like this one, it's starting to get a lot of press. It's starting to get a lot of uh, notoriety. And I, you know, I'll tell you something about this film that really made me believe in it in its final chapter of being sold. So when I reached out to Joel Olstein and I said, hey, we're, we were invited to the uh, Orlando International Film Festival, he decided to go into the studio and record that special open. That's how excited he is about this film and how, how much passion he has for the story. So I anticipate in, you know, over the next, in the coming months, we're gonna finish out some key interviews. You know, everybody say, say uh, a prayer. We're gonna get Michael Jordan in here, we're gonna get Spike Lee, we're gonna get Reggie Miller, uh, a couple other great announcers. And there's some, there's some more family things, there's some more storytelling from John. And I'd like to see this film out and distributed in 2022. Excellent. You've got to get Spike. I mean, yeah. you, you really had a connection with Spike, Lee. No, we, we can get Spike. That's, that's no problem. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we get it. I just don't want to take the movie from me, so I didn't want to take Thanks for seeing it right now. What are you going to do, man? John, we, we've been talking about various aspects of your legacy from on the court to your foundation, um, and then Lee introduced your family. Uh, ominous music to lead to this question. <laughs> no, um, talk to the most moving part of that film was seeing Monty, was it? Yeah. Talk about how he said, in this lifetime, I could never thank my brother enough. When you hear something like that, and you realize that through your own grit, determination, and God blessing you along the way, to be able to bring that kind of opportunity back to your family, not only for you to be able to do that, but then to see them take that catalyst and elevate their own lives to whole new levels of achievement and success and reaching out to other people and, 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 be, and making an impact in other people's lives. Uh, what is, how does that contextualize your whole life's journey for you? Yeah, well, I think that's what God put us down here for, right? Uh, to help one another. And, you know, for me, uh, it's just something that just inside of me and that was just put in inside of me by my mother, my grandmother, and the people I named is that we have to help one another. And so, uh, like uh, my sister said, Nicole on that, uh, and those thousand dollar checks was like my first first checks in the league. And that was like a hundred thousand dollar minimum wage at that time, now it's like six hundred thousand dollars. So, and I was living in California, y'all know California taxes is like, wow. I, I got a, a rude awakening to taxes when I first got into the league. I didn't know it was like that, but, um, but I just seeing what I could send at that time. And as I started making more money, I started sending more money to help my brothers and sisters, my cousins, my uncles. I, I just, you know, it just, I had to do it. You know what I mean? And I wanted to do it first and foremost because I wanted everybody to 
field of success. I just don't want to be the only one sitting up there on the hill in a nice house and have everything and they not enjoy it too. And so I wanted them to enjoy it and experience uh, what I was experiencing. And then as a final question, uh, same question to you both, but Lee, I'll start with you. Um, when, when people look at the theme of this film, and to keep shooting, to never give up, um, they might say, well, John, that worked out for you. Um, but I have these experiences in my life. And it's hard to say, I'm going to keep taking those shots. Uh, just with the fact that you want people to embrace this film, what would you, Lee, starting with you, what would you say to somebody in that situation where they are feeling really beaten down, they don't see the opportunity that might be out there, uh, what would you want to say to that person, have them take away from, from John's journey? Watch the movie and catch the feeling. Mm -hmm. Success, I've learned, is a feeling. It's a decision. You know, you see, John, why are we doing this? Because we've got to get that feeling back. We've got to get it back in our body. And as a filmmaker, I want to make films that challenge people, that make them think and make them feel. And with this movie, it's about feeling successful and never giving up. So I would say, Catch the feeling, never stop believing. That's what I would say. That's great. Nice. No, I, I concur with what Lee said. You know, it's all about the mindset. Uh, us as players, uh, you listen to coaches all the time, tell you to stay focused. Don't ever stop, you know, stop pushing yourselves. And, and so in, in that belief and that self, self-belief comes inside of you and you just don't stop and you keep going. Uh, that was put inside of me. Obviously, I had an older brother in Monty who used to push me all the time. And, and so uh, that belief was put inside of me. And, and you should never give up on whatever you want to do in life. And I always tell kids that whatever you want to do in life, believe it, write it down, and you're going to achieve it. That's great. Uh, before we close tonight, Clark Wayne's uh, chairman, president, uh, of Circle Center here has a presentation that you would like to There's a check. And we wish the check was bigger. That's that's a lot. <laughs> but here we are. And we hope there'll be more to follow. Yeah. You're a nonprofit like yourself, and it's evening like now. As a nonprofit center in Tulsa, Oklahoma, this is why Tulsa helped build this. This is what we're doing tonight, and we are proud to be part of it. And you should be proud as Tulsa that we have a theater like this that can perform events and honor people who have done great for Tulsa and leave making a film. And to think someday you'll look and see it on television, well, I saw it, they started making that, we yeah. got to hear them talk. Exactly. Not everybody in Oklahoma or America can say that. You guys can. And, th and, ladies, and thanks for being here. We appreciate it, sir, for saying that very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I <laughs> pleasure. All right, thank you. Thank you. So, actually, uh, the young man sitting up there, Miles, raise your hand, Miles. He's one of my scholarship uh, recipients. Right there. Hey, come here, Miles. Oh, look out, one more. You just got to be sure. Oh, what's up, Mike? Come on down. Here go another one. So just kind of talk to the people about what you're doing right now. All right. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I uh, was not expecting to speak today, but you know, I'm very honored considering you know, the event we're having today. So for those who haven't met me, my name is Miles DeMann. I'm a junior this fall at a school called Loyola Marymount University for uh, film and television. I just added a screenwriting minor. And I'm here uh, in Tulsa. You know, my family's from here. Keisha and Cordell I don't know if you guys know them, but if you do, those are my parents. And um, when I first started applying after I graduated from Booker T. Washington High School in 2019 for schools, I was like, wow, school is very expensive. I had no idea. I was like, I was going to public school, you know, doing things for free, and I really wanted to pursue film, but I'm like, I can't really do what I'm passionate about because, you know, money and capitalism and things like that. And I believe that the John Starks Foundation uh, Scholarship, or the Three Point Scholarship as it's formally titled, was one of the first scholarships I applied to, and I think my school recommended that I apply to it. And 
they were one of the first, you know, people to believe in me, to financially support me, and to kind of say, hey, we see what you're doing, and we want to push you forward. And that was really big for me because, you know, at that point, I hadn't had that very much. Of course, I had my family who wanted to support me and everything like that, which is great, but to see, like, an organization that had never met me before and wanted to put, you know, money with more than two zeros behind <laughs> the first digit and, you know, really support me in that way, that was great. And uh, as they said, the director, Jennifer Al Albert, she does an incredible job of checking in with her recipients, you know, undergrad and graduate students, seeing how we're doing, seeing how they can support us financially and emotionally, uh, career-wise, especially during the pandemic, they were great at just making sure that we felt supported and that we were in a good mental space to continue forward with our personal and collegiate you know, careers and professions and things like that. So I'm very honored to be speaking here wow. and to be you know, witnessing everything that's been happening with the organization and the documentary, and I'm super grateful. So thank, thank you, Miles. Thank you, Miles. Come over, Mark. Okay. No, you don't have to speak that long. Just introduce yourself. Uh, I wasn't expecting to speak on, so I just walked in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's what we do. We put you on the spot. <laughs> um, just introduce yourself. Well, I'm Morris Ritchie, the third. My dad's back there. Some of you may know my mom, Rose Washington. Um, but um, I'm attending OU in a month. Uh, I graduated from junior high school. And I was on the basketball team. I did an externship. Uh, what is it? Yeah, next gen. <laughs> oh! <laughs> yeah, next gen. That was that lasted like three weeks. That was really cool. I also got to earn a little bit of money. Uh, we got to meet with a lot of people. That was a lot of stuff. But, yeah, I've really just been trying to get ready for college. Move yeah. on campus, get my stuff ready. It's a big change. A lot of weight. And I turn 18 next week. So. Yeah, congrats. It's just a bunch of stuff just happening. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just living. Nice. I'm good hearing you out. There you go. I like that. Thanks a lot, bro. All right. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, you know, we are very fortunate to have students like uh, Mo and, uh, and uh, Miles. Miles, excuse me. My brain getting, like, getting tired now. Miles. Uh, on our uh, scholarship program, you know, we continue to help them uh, throughout their uh, college career. You know, how sometimes, you know, foundations just give that one hit. We don't do that. We make sure that we follow up with the students and making sure that, you know, they're on the right path to uh, graduating in college. And we continue to, you know, help fund, you know, their goals. And so thank you guys uh, for your commitment. You know, it's not just about the foundation, but it's for your commitment to uh, be great at, at life. So thank you. So I, I think the fact that a cowboy would let somebody spend their <laughs> foundation money with the Sooners, that's generosity. So that's charity right there. Um, well, that, that was the last minute. I didn't realize that. I don't know. <laughs> Everybody, thank you so much yeah. for joining us tonight, making this special event. Thank Obviously, you. Obviously, Sean, thank you both. Good luck with the film. And, um, and the Circle Cinema Film Festival this year is just getting started. It's going to take place through the weekend and into the first part of next week. Uh, certainly check out more information in the lobby about all the films that are showing, the events that are going on. Um, but thank you for helping us kick it off in great stock. Thank you.